Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hello, it's Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive here at episode 172 on my rainy weekend. It is 5.57 p.m. on Sunday, March 3rd, 2024. Wow! Okay, so your comments are very welcome. Please feel free to comment on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com or on our group on Ravelry, and the show notes are in both places. And there is a link on the Blogspot page. There's a link to the group on Ravelry, so you can always get there. And everything else, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you can buy me a coffee and all that. That's really nice. Please be aware that I'm still not adding people to my Instagram or my Facebook because of all the robo-accounts. You can follow me through this blog. That's why it's there. And so is the group on Ravelry for that reason, if you want to follow us. And you can also contact me through the Ravelry group or on this blog or on just Ravelry. It's it's really easy to find me. All right. In the warm thanks department, Meadow Lark Knits. Thank you for your nyak nyak Stanley mugs worth of coffee. That was a very generous thing, Jennifer, and I deeply appreciate it. And it's great to know you're out there. The other thing I like is, I believe it was Meadowlark Knits who said, wow, that whole thing you just did on dopamine, thanks. And I read that right after I recorded episode 171 where I apologized for that whole thing on dopamine. So let me tell you, Jennifer, you made my life worth living there. (laughs) I really appreciate that. And then, of course, we have the magnificent Steffi Joe, who, by the way, makes frequent appearances on the Warm Thanks Department because she's really great. And latest thing here, she added a new technique that improves the afterthought heel if you are high in the arch or in step. So I put the link in there, but also she added it to our list of links of techniques. So many thanks, Steffi Joe. I think the way you do heels is a huge thing in socks. I think you have to work your way through all the different types of heel out there. The heel flap and the fish lips kiss and the afterthought and the toe up forethought and all this. I think you really have to try these as you're making socks to figure out where your comfort zone is. For me, I made heel flaps for years and they fit a bit floppy. And I think I don't have any more heel flap socks left. I think those are actually all gone now from my sock stash. I have been making afterthoughts for quite a few years now, easily five years now. But I tried all the types of heel. And when I found the afterthought heel, and I believe I got it from the opinionated knitter from Elizabeth Zimmerman, but I don't believe I found exactly the way I do it there. I found the logic of it there. But I think using waste yarn to do the outline came from somewhere else. At any rate, I did an afterthought heel and said, this is magnificent. I'll never do a heel flap again because to me, it's just knit a brainless tube, put two half rows of waste yarn in, knit another brainless tube, do a brainless toe. And there is a moment of anxiety in the beginning. There used to be threading the needles through to get the afterthought heel to open up. Now I'm so used to doing it so I really would tell you, go try Steffi Joe's technique here and do not hesitate. If you're learning to make socks, do not hesitate. Try all the heels. Try everything you can think of. Try all the different sock architectures because you're going to find the one that fits you. Afterthoughts fit me great. Heel flaps, not so much because I have a very, very narrow heel. Okay, meanwhile... Under the warm thanks, strangely, we have the link for the Cognitive Fiber Retreat 10, 
in 2024, that is, and all the info is under that link. And I will come back to this in the calendar. So back at the knitting part, what is, you may say, on my hooks and needles? Well, first of all, I did finish the first sock of the Deep Stash Dive 2 socks. There it is. It is in the Blueberry Waffle Sock pattern, which I happen to dearly love because as you can see, it's meant to be a stripe. And once again, I did not get the gauge that the designer obviously wanted. So it would be a blotchy disaster, but now it's a blotchy disaster <laughs> with texture. <laughs> but I really like the way this turned out in spite of this. I have just learned that my gauge ain't going to ever work with certain designers of sock yarns, certain of the hand dyers. I just don't get their gauge. And I get gauge with all sorts of things like Regia and all these commercial yarns, but some of the sock dyers I'm just not. Now, this is lime and violet yarn, and this hasn't been made in over 15 years. Uh, this is from, I think, 2007 in my stash. At the time I bought this, I wasn't even making socks, but I was listening to Lime and Violet. They were inveterate sock knitters, and I was listening to Socks in the City, who I miss to this day. She had a fantastic, intelligent, funny podcast. Oh, there were so many different podcasts in those days, and of course they were all audio. Ah, where are the snows of yesteryear? At any rate, all those people were knitting on like size one needles. I've now slowly worked my way. I started on size threes because that's what my first pattern told me to do. And I've worked my way down over the years and now I'm using 1.5s. The deep stash dive two socks are on a size two. I was a little nervous about reducing my blueberry waffle socks to a 1.5 because those tend to come out just a squidge tighter than my favorite vanilla sock recipe that is my adaptation of somebody else's recipe. But there it is. And it came out looking, well, blotchy and beautiful. In progress, the stash toss, no change. 11 skeins in versus 26 out. So I'm looking forward to finishing some of these projects to change that ratio. The Love Hex cardigan. Boy, I'm happy with that. I cannot even tell you. This is the basic hexagon cardi. I'm using the basic campfire cardigan from the website Make and Do Crew. They're often favorably reviewed by other sites. And Make and Do Crew, I just finally read it. And apparently it's this uh, three women cooperative, two daughters and a mother, I think, and they're all crocheters. And they're all just building this website together. And they really are good. It's worth looking at Make and Do Crew. Their patterns are always free on the website, but it is notoriously disrupted by all the advertisements. But you can go in and buy the pattern, and usually you can buy it through Ravelry as well, same price as their website. It is very well worth looking at their crochet patterns. They cover a lot of the basics, things like this hex cardigan, the hexagon cardigan, and they just standardize it so any idiot like me can use it. And that's very valuable. But if you want to know a lot of basic crochet stuff, go over to Make and Do Crew. Meanwhile, I looked at it and said, it's cute. It's like a little jacket, but I want ribbing. So I've been looking up ribbing all week and experimenting with ribbing, just swatching my way. Now, I have done crocheted ribbing before several times, but I never thought much about it. And for this one, since I'm improvising, the original Campfire Cardigan doesn't use ribbing. So I started to improvise. So I've been looking at all these patterns for cardigans that look good in crochet. And I've been wandering around in Ravelry. And so I just came up with my own. So there is the link to the single stitch ribbing technique that I'm using. Because you can make ribbing in slip stitch, single stitch, half double, or half treble if you're British. Like you can make a ribbing out of so many different stitches. So I was experimenting and this is what I liked. Meanwhile, no real action on the 5th CFR 23 sock yarn cowl. It's just still going. And it's getting towards finished now. I have to admit, I've been doing this for weeks because it's really just sitting on my desk with all these little leftovers of yarn. I cannot tell you how happy I am that I have knitted to the very end of all these little scraps of sock yarn on this. I've gotten really blasé about changing colors. I will tell you, if you're 
a crocheter, but you started doing other things like knitting or dyeing before you learned crochet. These sock yarn cows, this is originally the Abba's sock yarn cow, I think is what it's originally called, but the link's in the show notes. These sock yarn cows will really get you to think about how you crochet and you will really brush up on stopping and starting a color. You get so used to it, you get over all your hesitation about crocheting over the ends and all that sort of stuff that bothers crocheters and occasionally doing a knot to hold a crochet ending in place. This is the way to get over your crochet hang-ups, let me tell you. So anyway, I am still working on number five and I think I've got numbers two and three here. I know three is one of them, I'm not sure. It might be three and four here. They're sitting on my desk. I just use them all the time. I throw them on every time I walk outdoors to keep my neck warm and to hide my old lady neck. Huh, <gasps> Gemma, you didn't say that. Yes, I have postmenopausal neck. Meanwhile, back at the podcast, February 24, I am at about the end of the stockinette. So I have to sort of make the time to run a needle through half of the live stitches and put them on waist yarn so that I can start going up the back. Sadly, in all my memories on Facebook, I am now seeing my previous vestuary vests, which I had finished by now, but I just fell down the rabbit hole of the hex cardigan. And so thank you for your patience. Who really cares? I have learned that I have all these sweaters I want to make, but I sort of realized I really care about making the annual vest. It's a great way to get through four skeins that I'd like to get out of the stash in a really productive way. Who doesn't need a denim blue or a blue jeans actually is the colorway. A blue jeans blue vest. Who isn't going to use that? If you have my coloring at least, you know. Because I have what is usually roses and cream. Uh, If you're British, I have pale pink on my rather white pasty skin. (laughs) And then I have green eyes. So blue and green work really well for me. So if you have any coloring, anything akin to mine, this is going to be a good color. So of course I'm making it, but it was meant for a twin face and she just didn't want it. So hey, oh, ow, ooh, make me suffer. Meanwhile, I'm well down the deep stash dive one second sock. That's going very well. I have not yet hit the heel, but I'm pretty close to it by now. So I think I did start the lime and violet sock I was just telling you about. I did start that second stock and I'm into its ribbing. But the stashed I have one sock, I'm on the second sock and I'm well through it. I have noticed that I never have problems with second sock syndrome. I simply refuse to. But I have noticed that one of the things when I finish a sock, I immediately start the second sock. Like in the same sitting, I will do the Kitchener stitch on the heel of my first sock and then I will go on and start the ribbing of the second sock. And that's what keeps me from having unfinished pairs of socks. But the other thing I really like doing, I like to have two different pairs of socks going at the same time. And they can both be blueberry waffle type or they can both be the vanilla sock type. I don't care, but I actually seem to be happier if a bit slower when I'm doing two different pairs of socks, and that's pretty much what I'm doing now. No action in the spinning world on Dizzy Blondes, and I have the usual resource links, which I think I'm probably going to move to the bottom of the show notes right above Minerva Gets the Last Word. And that brings us on to a strategy. Well, in the strategy world, we are working on overthinking. And I was actually looking at various pieces of Japanese psychotherapy. I do not know a lot about how the Japanese do psychotherapy. They do it, but I have no idea how close or far it is from more Western styles, like obviously what I'm using. However, what I'm using is effectively a blend of Stoic philosophy and Buddhism. So there's definitely some bleed over there. But I was mincing my way through Japanese sites and they were pointing out one of the best cures for overthinking is to go into nature. And the way they tend to look at it is going into nature calms your body and that will lead to calming your mind. 
which is actually a very Hindu way to look at it, the body first, then the mind. Buddhists usually say the mind will control the body, you know, so they sort of flip it. At any rate, go into nature. And I was thinking about that, remembering that back in the 80s, there was a lot of research on color. And yes, guess what? Why are all hospitals green? They used to be. Now they're changing color and I'll come to that. Because in the original research in the 1980s, they found that humans are at their most calm when they are in green. Well, duh, <laughs> you know, that's going to pretty much take you to where I'm going, isn't it? That humans do better when they are in green spaces for the most part, but it's not just painting your room green. In fact, I hate to admit this, the later research shows there's only one thing better than green. It's pale pink. I don't even want to speculate on what that means about what humans like or where they got that from. But at any rate, pale pink and green. And yes, in the 1980s, we were using forest greens and pale pinks to decorate our homes. My first house, it was so beautiful anyway. But humans like green. But there is more to it than that. And that is, if you look at the visuals in nature, they move slowly. You actually see nature. Things don't go at high speeds, the way they do on computers, in animation, that it's moving more slowly and that's easier on our processing mentally. So that slows our brains down. It's good for us. The sounds are not mechanical. The sounds are good for us, but also now in a very weak way that I hope we improve on in the next 10 years before I retire, we're starting to look at frequencies of sound around us and also frequencies of light. We are oriented to daylight. That's all you can say, humans do better in daylight. And one of our biggest problems here in the first world is we have all these daylight screens around us that our phones, our televisions, our movie theaters, our computer screens, our monitors, they're all attuned to a daylight frequency. This is not an evil conspiracy. This is actually helping us to stay awake as we work. However, as you've heard me say many times, you got to turn that off at night or you can't go to sleep. You got to get all that stuff away from you. So the thing is when you're out in daylight, that's actually a great visual frequency for us. Humans do really well. We are diurnal, but there's more sound frequencies. This opened up more explosively in terms of research when somebody noticed that the purr of a cat is at a frequency that encourages the bones of mammals to knit. So cats who are injured will purr and they're trying to get their own body to heal. Other cats who find them will usually lie up close to share body warmth, we think, because cats very, very high body temperature, which is why they're always trying to lie on warm things, including you. But cats will lie against an injured cat to help it maintain body temperature and they will purr and the vibration is at a frequency that heals bones. And you knew where that was going to take us. Suddenly they're wondering when we do orthopedic surgery, should we be running that frequency through the operating room? Turns out there may be a lot of frequencies out there in nature that we really, really need to be paying attention to. I know there was work on crickets or katydids the frequency of their chirps. I forget this. I know this was a big thing in the late eighties that they found out their frequency is good for us. There's this huge amount of stuff going on out there. Last but not least, there's fresh air that if you sit in a building, you're breathing in the dust of the building. The dust of the building is basically waste falling off objects in the building, including dead skin cells and all that. Okay. If you go out into nature, you're not breathing that you're breathing unsullied air, unless of course you're in downtown LA, but I digress. If you go into a place that is not polluted, that's what you need to do. You need to get that fresh air. And also there is research. I do not know all of this. This is more in physiology land about the effects of air on skin surface, including different currents of air, different temperatures of air. Look guys, we were not what do you want to say? Created, evolved. I don't care what you believe in. 
we were not established to walk around covered in synthetic fiber, breathing recycled air, looking at odd frequencies of screens and daylight or light that is not daylight and absorbing sound frequencies that are not natural. We're not built for this, guys. So one of the things you have to routinely do is calm your body by going outdoors, by going into nature. And yes, that is going to help your overthinking. Now, having said that, so I'm a runner. From the age of 10, I secretly began running, hoping my family wouldn't make fun of me. They would have. And I really blossomed as a runner. I began to run really routinely in high school. And that helped me physically. But when I got to college, I ran because I was on a team. I was on the rowing team. And I became a routine runner to get fit. And that's when, oh my gosh, I don't know if I was in college or if I was in grad school at Stanford. That is, I went to college, then I went to Scotland for two years, then I went to Stanford. I think I was at Stanford when they developed little tape recorders you could run with that were reliable. The original tape recorders you carried around, if you went running, you would disrupt the tape. But by the time I got to my PhD in the mid-80s, they had stabilized tape recorders with wired earphones. So now you could run through beautiful nature listening to headbanger music. And I knew people who did. And there was all these things about why it was so great for you. To be honest, yeah, I have to admit, I run with podcasts. I used to run with Zombies Run, which was a running program that was a narrative that was a lot of fun. I've run with music, which after a while I get kind of bored. I do with podcasts too. I have to admit, these days I like to run in silence. I like to run just with the noises around me. I'm going to be honest, I've been a woman runner running alone since I was 10 years old. As I was pointing out to somebody today, I have been attacked and pursued more times than I can tell you since I began to run in 1970. If you are a woman runner, it's part of the deal. And you can say all the liberated and intelligent things you want to say if you're a woman runner and you run alone, being attacked is part of the deal. That's why I ran with German Shepherds for so many years, and I'd like to do it again, I might add. All right. But the worst times of my life professionally, when I was dealing with wildly suicidal or violent patients, I ran. And that's not an accident. And I ran with no noise, but with a dog. And yes, I had to watch out for the people who would attack me if I didn't have the dog with me. And so, you know, you can go into nature and wire yourself into earphones. I would say take an armed and loaded German Shepherd if you're going to do that. But to be honest, you do get a better high out of it if you're not listening to things in earbuds, if you're simply listening to your environment. And there is a safety issue there. However, you have to start working on thought stopping. You can't let your runs turn into obsessive thinkings about what you can't fix. I used to work through my caseload thinking about what I needed to do. That worked very well. But if you're torturing yourself with repetitive thought and you're going into nature, maybe you do need the earbuds. I hate to say that. Okay, but meanwhile, if you want to calm your mind, you have to work on soothing your body. And that means you have to go into nature. Get out into the greenery. I will point out while I'm talking about calming your body, Yes, I do believe in bathing twice a week in Epsom salts to replenish your magnesium. That also helps your sleep and soothes you. You really need to take care of the electrolytes. The other thing I routinely do to calm my body, and this may be because I'm keto, I drink Keterade, which I've given you the recipe for, almost every day. I'll have a few shots of Keterade just to make sure that I'm keeping my electrolytes going. But all of this is about the same theme, which is if you want to stop overthinking and calm your mind, you have to work on the vehicle that is encasing your mind. That is your body. And this goes for what I said before. Your brain is a machine and your mind is allegedly running it if you're doing things right. But your brain is integrated into your body. So if you think you're going to calm your brain without working on soothing your body, you need to get over that. The other thing, I'm saying go into nature, but I might as well go whole hog. I believe in things like getting routine full body massages. No, I haven't had one in months. I could kick myself. I also believe in going and getting the luxury 
haircut where you have them wash your hair, massage your scalp. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that. And I believe in the luxury pedicure where they massage your legs and soak your feet in warm water. Soaking your feet in Epsom salts and any kind of electrolyte bath is extraordinarily good for you. But just getting them into warm, not hot water is extremely good for the hygiene of your feet, for getting the skin unpolluted from time to time. So all of this really is calm your mind by calming your body. The absolute shortcut, go out into nature. Go out, breathe fresh air, take a walk, see some greenery. Ha! Huh, having said that, I'll shoot. I'm up to 25 minutes a day on my bike desk. I should hit 150 miles since I started this in November, taking a long break for COVID. But I am really, really happy with this. Again, if you think that you are going to feel good without exercising, you're kidding yourself. And if you're younger, if you're under 45, you need to exercise. Why? Because that's going to push away the chronic diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer. Okay, hard exercise pushes it away. Yes, those are actually considered diseases of aging. So a lot of people get them after 45. In my family, we get diabetes before 45. I pushed it back to 58. Both my parents, my aunts and uncles on my father's side, I don't know the history on my mother's side, all had diabetes. So the whole goal for me my whole life, and this is why I started running at 10 years old, when a doctor told me I needed to be ready for diabetes someday. My whole life I've been working on this, all right? I'm going to tell you I'm so grateful. If I look back at my 63 years and I think what is the best stuff I did, the single best thing I did was start exercising routinely when I was 10. Absolutely the best thing, and it is never too late. We have research galore. People who start exercising for the first time in their 60s show incredible improvement and incredibly good outcomes compared to people who don't exercise in their 60s. Now, having said that, please remember that doesn't take into account any chronic illnesses. You know, you really need to talk to your doctor if you're that age and you're going to start exercising and you never have. And you really need to do it in a slow, thoughtful way if you're going to be able to do it at all. This is something you consult with your doctor on at any age before you start an exercise program. You really do want to talk to a doctor. You also really want to do a lot of research. <laughs> you know, when I started running in the 70s, what can I tell you? It was a fad. All the Hollywood people were running. We even had TV shows, the bionic, what is it? Six, the Six Million Dollar Man, the bionic woman, where in the introduction to it, the intro song, they were running and it, they were doing it because that was a fad at the time. And so these two shows were glorifying it. Look, you're bionic. But don't kid yourself, that influenced me at 10 years old. I have no problem with that. So, you know, the reality is, though, the single best thing I've done in my life was running throughout my lifespan. And someone said, are you still going to run? I do from time to time, but I'm starting to have hip issues because I'm postmenopausal. If you start that problem, you're probably not going to recover well from it. So that is inhibiting my running. But... I still consider myself a runner and I do work out every day. I do 25 minutes on my bike desk and I'm going to continue to do that. My goal is to get to 30 minutes a day. And when I get really comfortable with that, I'm going to start thinking about, do I want to do that twice a day? Do I want to go up to an hour a day in one fell swoop? How do I want to go from there? Still considering it, but I'm going very well on that. And I cannot recommend it enough. I just looked at the fit desk. I think it's like $190. And uh, has its own website, as I gave you last episode, I believe. I think it's also on Amazon. I have been very happy with my Fit Desk. I've now had it. Believe it or not, I think I may have had it. I think I had it in the quarantine. I think I got it late in the quarantine. So 2020 is like four years or something. I love the thing. I love the thing. Also, if you buy the add-on wings for the desk, which I highly recommend you do, that gives you a lot of desk surface. Someone said, but can you put two computer screens on it? Haven't tried, but I wouldn't want to put a screen on a stand on that desk because the desk is vibrating as you bike. Nonetheless, I do often see patients while I'm on my bike. I just bike so gently so they don't see me swaying. I could not be happier about this.
in the fluffy books, I did watch another episode of the Alexander the Great documentary on Netflix. What really is coming out is he's extremely brilliant as a military strategist. They try to explain it in all different ways. And sure, he's getting his ideas from different people, including the Empress of the Persians, who he has hostage until she dies in childbirth with his son. And I'm, I'm not even going to comment on that because I can't even imagine what the pressures on her and her daughter were like. They're both in the camp of the Greeks as they're going through Egypt. And Alexander does pretty much what the Romans will do after him. They go to, he goes, they all go to Egypt. And as they put it, he goes native as the phrase is, that he begins to take on the customs of the Egyptians. And as they do later with the Romans, you know, with Mark Antony and Julius Caesar, they say, oh, is he going, is he just getting sucked into their culture? Or is this a military tactic to get the Egyptians to go along with them? One thing never changes throughout classical history. Egypt is rich. Everybody wants it. Great source of food, great source of grain, great source of fiber for linen and cotton. At any rate, you can't get away from the fact the guy is brilliant. You can't get away from the fact he really can see the built-in weaknesses of the Persian Empire. He's got a good sense of the idea that the outreaches, the Western outreaches across from where he's raised in Macedonia. Those Western outreaches have a lot of Greek people living in them who can be easily either swayed or forced back to a loyalty to Greece. And there's a lot of stuff going on there. He sees that if he can take the very Western edge of Asia Minor, Egypt will now be behind him, which means he can cut it off from Persia. It's just smart tactics. And you watch it, and when you see it on maps, you go, that is amazing. I'm not sure what the map culture was like in Alexander's time. If he was seeing this on maps the way I'm seeing it, because we have, you know, satellite mapping from outer space. But that's what keeps coming across. There's a lot of fantasizing around who Alexander is. I simply don't know. And I don't know because I have not studied that era. So I'm not going to pretend to understand the culture either of the Persians or of the Greeks or the Macedonians, as it were. I'm not even going to pretend. I think I would sound like an idiot. I think you have to be very deeply versed in that stuff to even know. I don't feel a great loyalty to any of them. I'm descended from Romans far, far, far back, according to the family traditions on the Italian side. Heaven only knows what I'm descended from on the Amish side. I haven't really researched those particular lines of you know tribal culture and all that before the Middle Ages. Even my medieval history in Western Europe is pretty weak, to be honest, except for Britain. So, you know, I just don't know enough. But it is very interesting to watch. It's much harder for me to look at this and say where they're right and where they're wrong. But it's interesting. It's okay. I, like I said, I don't like these, you know, docudrama type things. I prefer good straight up documentaries with historians talking. I like the Ken Burns type where they're reading from the documents of the time out loud, and then some good historians are kind of thinking it over out loud about what it would have been like. But, all right, I'm on, I think I, I'm at episode four. I think there's six episodes, and I, I'm quite enjoying it nonetheless. But I'm not going to vouch for its historic integrity. I do think they're trying to be respectful to both sides in this, the Persians and the Greeks. I think they're just demonstrably wrong about both, to be honest. And you can't know beyond that. Like, there are a few things I can see they're getting wrong about the Greeks. And, you know, I have no idea about the Persians. But they seem to be trying to be respectful, and that's good enough. Meanwhile, the newest Verity Lark by Lynn Messina has come out. And also, there is a new book in the related series about Beatrice, the Duchess of Kesgrave. I can't remember if it's Kesgrave or Kesgrove. Anyway, the books are now running very close together um, in narrative. So it's getting a lot more fun to read. It's a little awkward 
as Messina is transitioning between the two series, trying to build into the Beatrice Hyde Clare series. She tries to build the beginnings of the Verity Lark series, and they just sort of stand out like, why are you telling us this? It's not really related to Beatrice's narrative, but it begins to make sense as you go. For those of you who are paying attention, Beatrice means beautiful, it means blessed, but it's also our root for the word beauty. Verity is the word for truth. Way to go, Ms. Messina. Anybody who uses words at that depth, I like it. I also got the one of the newer books in the series of, I, I think of them as Fangirl Knits by Tannis Gray. This has been a fantastic series. She has the Star Wars collection. She has the two Harry Potters. I know I'm missing one more that she's got. But anyway, she's now got The Nightmare Before Christmas, and I got that. She also has a Tolkien book out there. I haven't bought it yet. I bought this. I know even before I bought it, I thought I'm probably not going to get much use out of this. So yeah, if you're coming to CFR 10, this is probably going to be a prize. Let's be honest here. But I'm so glad I got it. It's just a great collection. It's some really interesting stuff. I have to tell you, I am not goth in any way, shape, or form. I'm really not. I, I Maybe I lean in a little on the witchy side. I like witchy type things. But the reality is I, I'm not very goth, as it were, like 1980s goth, which I know many of you are too young to even know what I'm talking about. But this is that book. If you are into goth knitting, this is that book. The really great stuff, she has good figures, toys, that is, of the, some of the major characters. And if you're goth in your taste, you want this book. It is the usual stuff. It is fan delight. If you love Tim Burton, if you love The Nightmare Before Christmas, you really want this book. It is good. The patterns are good. The photography is gorgeous. And like all this series, the photography is pretty comprehensive. You're looking at a pattern and saying, well, that's great, but what I'd really like to see is the back of that pattern. You turn the page, there's the back. I can't say enough good thing about Tannis Gray's books. I'm just going to be straight up front. No, I don't take sponsorships. So if I'm telling you this, believe me, I'm serious. I'm not paid to say this, but it's just good stuff. So while this isn't my particular cup of tea, it's a smart book. It's beautifully illustrated. The patterns are funny and original and interesting. Very goth themed if you like that or if you like Tim Burton or if you like The Nightmare Before Christmas. This is the book you want. It's got little splatterings of inside information from the filming of it and all that. You're just going to love it. This is a coffee table book if you're goth. But this is also a really good collection, beautifully photographed, beautifully written and edited of this type of pattern. So I'm really going to give two thumbs up to the Nightmare Before Christmas collection by Tannis Gray. Link is in the show notes. Something I really like, well, this is a step into the different. I like the fish doorbell. And you can see a screenshot of this in show notes. What in the heck is the fish doorbell? It's a website by the city of Utrecht. Utrecht. I, I can't say it. I can't make that noise in German or Dutch. I can't make the sound right, the, the CHT noise. But anyway, Utrecht, I think is how most Americans say it. And I've been there. It's a fabulous place. If you're, if you're traveling in the Netherlands and Germany, you really need to go see it. It's one of the don't miss places. However, in the downtown of the city, there is a canal and it has a lock. And in the good old days, they had a lock keeper who opened it routinely as the overland barges went through. Now, the other thing that goes through are the local fish. And in the spring, particularly at night, fish are going up to that lock and they're trying to get through it because they need to swim upstream to mate, like the salmon do in North America. So the people who trashed were worried about this. They didn't want the fish to die out, but in the middle of the night, who's going to open the lock? And the lock has to be opened manually. So they came up with this wonderful idea called the Fish Doorbell. It's a website and it's got a live camera. And you can see a picture of the camera is in action in that picture, but it just looks like a blur of dark water. Okay, but it's got a live camera. If you see a fish there, 
you click on the button. There's a doorbell right there. You can see it. It's a pink box, like a dark rose box with a white center. That's the doorbell. You click on the fish doorbell to tell the people in Utrecht that there are fish stuck at the lock. They actually monitor this. When they get enough clicks, enough people are looking at this and they're saying there are fish stuck there. I don't know what their threshold number is, but the lock keeper opens the lock. So basically what they're doing is they're mechanizing the system for the lock keeper so he doesn't have to stand there in the dark trying to look at fish in black water. Okay, I think it's a brilliant idea. It's one of these things only, only in that region. You know, all the trains run on time. I mean, this is just another example. Like, good Lord, they're efficient. So go look at the fish doorbell. That is simply a picture without live links. It's a screenshot, but there is a live link in the show notes to the fish doorbell. I highly recommend you have a look at this. I laughed and then I watched it for hours. It will tell you how many people are watching it. Usually there's at least 300 people at any one time. I've turned it on in the middle of the night watching the fish doorbell. Help the fish. Put a lid on it. Nothing really special this week in the tea tastings. I did try an apple custard, I think it's called, from Plum Deluxe. And no, <laughs> no, no. Now there's an interesting thing. When you make an apple tea, in my opinion, your mileage may vary. Apple teas need two things, cinnamon and some kind of sweetener. This one, they're kind of doing without both, or at least that's what it tastes like. And I just think this falls a little flat. If I want hot apple, I drink apple cider. That's me. And I don't necessarily need that to be really sweet. But this one, this was a good attempt. But to me, this was just a, a tinge flat is all I can say about it. I don't dislike it. It is an herbal. And I can't help thinking that this is their herbal attempt to imitate one of their black teas that probably does come across more as a milder apple cinnamon. Now you may remember I was drinking horny teas for a while until they wouldn't guarantee that they weren't soaking the tea leaves in sugar. They were evasive when I asked them. So that's the end of horny for me. But Harney makes a range of very hot cinnamon teas, black teas that are very strong and very spicy. And I like them quite a bit, I must admit. In cold weather, they're a kind of nice wake up, but they are caffeinated teas. So I think there is this ongoing thing in all the companies to try to give a strong apple flavored tea. And I think they're aiming towards the apple cider range Still looking for that tea. I have to admit, the one I've liked the best is called Hot Apple Cinnamon, I believe, by Harney's, but I'm not buying their teas. I'm working my way through Plum Deluxe's catalog quite happily. Thank you. In the blather, it rained all weekend, and I'm so, so grateful. I'm just plowing through the house projects. In the project where I am cutting leftover fabrics for quilt strips, I've now gotten through the huge pile of leftovers from the skirts I made last year. And so I have this huge, huge bin. I think it's 18 liters or something of these strips. And so when I finish this project, essentially the next one will be just piecing strips into blocks for projects. And I'm thinking about pillows for around the house. I'm thinking about refreshing all the pillows, putting pillow shams out in the bedrooms. I'm thinking about throws and log cabin patterns in general, including bed coverings. Why not? So I'm thinking about no specific pattern. At most, I'm thinking about log cabins. I do have a wonderful book that I reviewed a while back. You all may remember about using pre-cut strips. I think it was pre-cut strips and blocks. It's around here somewhere. Don't worry, because you will probably be hearing that again. I'm also looking up at one of the classic books on quilting, patchwork quilting and applique. Like there's so much you can do if you just cut down your extra fabrics into squares, rectangles and strips. My standard strip is two and a half inches, understanding that I will lose a quarter inch on each side to salvage and to seams. So 
that's what I do. But anyway, that is going phenomenally well. So now I went into my old sewing box and I had leftover fabrics from the dresses and skirts I made, believe it or not, in the early 1990s. And they're so beautiful. I so miss this. In those days, the fabrics were florals. They were just doing these phenomenal florals. And you don't see good florals anymore. It's just not in vogue right now. So I was wailing a lot as I was going through these and they look like new. They've been sitting in that box for 30 years. So that's been fun cutting them into strips and we'll see where that goes. So in other words, I'm now onto my leftovers when I get finished that. We'll see where I do next. As I told you already, the t-shirts are cut up, but I just found a whole bunch of t-shirts sitting in a cabinet we don't use. And I looked at them and said, oh, maybe I need to wash these babies and cut up some more t-shirts. And that, of course, is for t-shirt quilts or t-shirt pillows. Again, upcycle. Don't throw it in a landfill. And I will tell you something. You could do a lot worse in this world than cutting these things into strips and then looking at them. Do not think I haven't thought of this and saying, I don't want to work with these after all. Take them to the Goodwill, take them to a craft exchange, give them to another fabric worker, but you're going to help somebody else do their projects, okay? Meanwhile, the walkway, my son put together all of the solar lights in our next set. They're sitting here in the room with me. So I'm getting ready to go out and install those, hopefully with him. Our fourth strip is not completely nailed down even still. I'm still tacking that in. But we're getting there. And basically, I go out when I can and I whap in 10 pegs. I think I've got about 30 more pegs to go. The garage camera, it is not hung yet because we're having some trouble with our ring system. However, that's something I can work out. I'm not too worried about it. But I did just get a second battery for it because it is a two battery camera. That is, it will work off one camera battery and then switch to the other. So why not get both in there? Meanwhile, in the spring cleaning, we're back at Project G. The way we're doing it is I'm now doing, as I told you, 15 minutes of shredding every day. That's going fabulously. By my estimate, I have four full-size cartons full of single sheets of paper that have to be shredded. But this is really it. After I get rid of this stuff from my office world, and these are, in other words, old patient files that are now past the statute of limitation. Once I get rid of these, I'm looking at all these binders around my study as I sit here stuffed with paper and they're going to go next. That is, I'm going to start scanning them into digital and then shredding the paperwork because I don't need to have the original paperwork. I might be thinking of getting a better scanner down the line, one that I can feed papers into instead of having to lift the lid of the flatbed, lay it down, etc. We'll see how that goes. That's a project for a later day. But the shredding goes onward and now there's, as far as I can tell, there's four cartons. I, I know this sounds discouraging, I am probably a little more than halfway through the first carton. That is a week of shredding 15 minutes a day. You can see a picture of my shredder there in the show notes. You can also see I have a garbage bag next to it and a little stool, and it's just set up. And the really nice news, my husband now goes in there. When he passes through, he just grabs a handful of paper and shreds it, which is a really great idea. You know, as Benjamin Franklin said, little strokes fell great oaks or shred them in this case. Meanwhile, I continue to spend time transferring everything on my computers and my phones and my tablets to digital. This has been extremely successful this week. All my tablets and my iPhone are cleared. My PC I'm not working on yet. I'm using the PC as the link that I have the digital drive plugged into it. And I'm basically putting flash drives onto the PC well, actually, I'm not loading them onto the PC anymore. I'm letting them go through the file organizer in the PC into my digital storage, my four terabyte. Ah, I'm just trying to get the 4T loaded up with everything I have. And when that is done, I will take its cousin, the other 4T, and I will hook them both into the PC and use the PC as the bridge and transfer everything from one to the other, and that second one will be off the premises in a safe place. I think most likely a safe deposit box at a bank, but I'm still thinking about all the options there. The idea is you back up all your digital stuff, you clean off all the computers you use from day to day. For me, that's the tablets, the phone, the PC, and the remarkable 
PDF tablet. Clean all that stuff off so you're ready to go. And it's a good part of the spring cleaning to clean out your digital and update it. So I'm really happy with that. It's not fun and you get very little to show for it. Except today I went through the Remarkable, eliminating everything I thought I didn't need so far. I've got a long way to go on the Remarkable. I'm probably about halfway through clearing it off. It's six gig of PDFs, but that's a lot in terms of individual PDFs. But I've already recovered half the drive on the Remarkable just by what I've done so far and being able to clear it off the Remarkable. So I'm very happy about that. The pup date, well, Captain needs her shots, but I need my car. So hopefully my husband will get his new tires put on this week. We did buy tires. We're happy about that. Meanwhile, in the calendar, Yarnopoly and Second Saturday Stitchers, they are Facebook groups for the Santa Clarita Valley. And we have people coming up from CME, people coming down from the AV. Their meetups are on the second Saturday of each month, typically. But go to their Facebook groups. And you can see their names and spellings in the show notes under calendar at the bottom. The Sit and Stitch group, which is in the Joanne Darcy Library in Canyon Country. It's on the second and fourth Saturday of the month from 10 to noon. CFR 10 is coming up at the Courtyard by Marriott on September 28, 2024. That is a Saturday. There is a link there to the information, which is a thread on our Ravelry group. And I also am happy to say I'm taking Friday the 27th off so that I will get a chance to be there and relaxed on Friday instead of rushing in last minute after patients like I did last year. <laughs> Meanwhile, Romuel is slated for December 21st through January 1st. It's very fun. As I'm accumulating days off, I'm requesting these days off. So everything you hear that I'm, I have in as requests I think my company has a policy of not approving our request like a month beforehand, but if I don't take days off, if I don't put them in as requests, I stop accumulating vacation days, so I'm working on that. So that's all working extremely, extremely well. So I think Minerva's going to get the last word here. What would Minerva say to you? Well, she allowed me to put a picture in of her big sister, Captain. Captain's lying on her side, dozing. And you can see her teeth, her little white teeth are sticking out. And she's all curled up and she's smiling because Minerva wants you to know when in doubt you should hire a contractor or a subcontract. And that, I believe, is what has been going on with the mice. It seems to me that we have now had two more mice this week killed. And each mouse is very wet. In a way, I doubt Minerva is going to make them. So I suspect what's going on. We only get a dead mouse when Captain and Minerva are in the big bedroom together at night. I suspect what's going on is Minerva is chasing them out in the open and it's Captain who's grabbing them in her mouth and that's probably killing the mouse. So we get a very saliva covered mouse. And today when I found the mouse next to my chair in my study, how did that happen? To be honest, I actually think it got dragged there by the tail by the Roomba. That's my guess. Honestly, we're not living normal lives here at Rancho de Casa de Cognitive, let me tell you. At any rate, it seems to me this has to be a two-person job, killing these mice. We never see Minerva kill anything when she's by herself. My husband has caught her with mice that she was playing with and seemed uninterested in killing. Do I think Captain's killing them? Not really. I think she could be. She is part... Border Collie, which might have a prey drive that would drive her to do that. Newfies have very low prey drive. I think what she's probably doing is just catching it with her prey drive. And I think it's too much for the mouse. So I think that's taking out our mice. Today's mouse had a mark that I think killed it. No blood. That makes me feel a little horrible. But it looked like a fang from a dog. A big fang got it. So Minerva's last word. I'm sorry about the graphics here. When in doubt, hire a contractor. Get someone to help you. So there's a picture of both of them. Captain is sleeping with an idiotic smile on her face. Minerva is on my lap. As you can see, she is doing what I call the Udon Noodle. She is a broad, flat, furry noodle. And on the right side of that picture, her forequarters and head are slopping over the side of my right knee. And you're looking at her rump up to her shoulder blades in that picture, and she's just passed out on my nice warm lap while I'm knitting 
on the Stash Dive 2 sock. So there you go. When in doubt, get help. Get a contractor. Do what you got to do. Having said all that, remember, everybody, we are in cold and flu season. COVID is out there. I know because it's everywhere around here now. Right now, actually, RSV is going around. We, there is a new vaccine for RSV. You might consider it. But what I'm going to say overall is think about your community when you take care of yourself. You take care of the community. When you take care of yourself, you're thinking about other people, not just yourself, how you're not going to infect them. So if you don't want to get all the shots, I'm great with that. Stay home, really. But in the meantime, everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.